good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Donna Walker, president of Washington Association of Black Journalists, and we'd like to welcome you to our conversation with the candidates. We have our two candidates for the position of VP of Broadcast, NABJ, VP of Broadcast. Uh, to my left is Ms. Gail Hurd. Hi, and Dorothy Tucker. Uh, before we start, we wanted to just say a few words um, uh, of condolences, unfortunately. Um, it's been um, kind of an interesting morning when we were faced um, with the news of the passing of one of the greats and one of the legends of TV, especially here in the Washington area, uh, Mr. Jim Vance, who passed away this morning at the age of 75. Um, he had been on the air here in the D.C. area for some 40 years, primarily at NBC4. So we wanted to say on behalf of WABJ that we express our condolences on his death. We knew him. He was a friend of our chapter. He was always friendly, energetic, and supportive and loved by those who knew him and those who watched him in their homes every evening. And of course he was a veteran journalist and inspired many young people as well as other broadcasters in the industry. And even though he was based in D.C., he was known around the country. Oh, so. He was definitely larger than life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I grew up going to the NAPJ and seeing Jim, and Jim was always one of those senators who would share knowledge. He was a role model. He was a trailblazer. And my condolences to his NAPJ family here and his his family around D.C. Mm, absolutely. Uh, WABJ family, I know it's such a loss, found out on my way here and uh, was just shocked. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always heard about Jim Vance. I didn't grow up in the D.C. area, but you could not come through this town and be in this business and not hear about him. Mm -hmm. And I did have the opportunity to meet him at a couple of NABJs as well. And so um, on behalf of Region 3 and definitely NABJ, we send our love and our condolences to everyone who was touched by his, his life and his work. Thank you for that, and we, we as well. Um, he was always there again to support us and the chapter uh, when he could. He, he did what he could when he could, so he was definitely, her presence will be missed. Okay, so we wanted to <coughs> have an informal chat with our, our candidates here, and we will be taking questions from our audience, but I'd like to just uh, start the conversation with a, a very broad question about the state of journalism, the whole industry, um, in this climate of fake news when, when the whole industry is, is being, you know, painted with this label. And how do we proceed in this climate? What's your, your what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, this has been, so the bane of our existence in a way, because we, uh, you know, have been dealing with it, especially this past year, if not less than that. Um, as a matter of fact, as Region 3 Director, the, one of the biggest topics of our last uh, conference in Dallas was the whole issue of fake news and freedom of the press under fire. I mean, I feel that we are in a position we've never dealt with ever before. I mean, I, at least not in, in our recent <laughs> uh, time on this earth. And it's unprecedented, it's unprecedented, and it's challenging times for us. But you know, African American journalists have always been challenged. So I think we are up for it. But I think we still have to continue to speak truth to power. We still have to continue to fight that good fight. NABJ has already banded together with some of the other organizations, uh, media organizations, to at least put a letter out there, put some information out there and say, you know, this is not right, we are here, we're here to hold you accountable, and that must continue. I mean, politicians, everybody who's in power needs to be held accountable for their actions. Hey, we all do, really, when you think about it, but especially those in power. So uh, we still have to keep that good fight and still do the work that we know is important and, you know, tell the truth and do the, you know, do the good work, regardless of who's challenging us on whatever uh, level. I, I think what we're seeing, um, our, our industry is, is under attack. Uh, this year, probably more than ever before. I mean, if you just look at the headlines, you see the demotion of Tamron Hall at NBC being replaced 
with Megyn Kelly. You see the allegations of discrimination and racism uh, going on at Fox, uh, the lawsuits against CNN, the AP, things that are going on both print and broadcast. Diversity is almost under attack. So this has been a very trying year for NABJ. Um, because of what has been going on, we have been very active in terms of advocacy because our president, Sarah Glover, is, she works for NBC. I have had to lead the committee to have conversations with NBC and take a look at their hiring and their retention and their promotion and their mentorship. And we are in the process of forming a task force with NBC that focuses on diversity. But we recognize that, uh, as we know, there are television stations and newspapers, but networks across this country that have the same kind of issues of the lack of management, African Americans in management. And that is something that we are looking at at all the networks and we have reached out to all of them so that we can begin to establish a relationship where we look at hiring, promotion, mentorship, um, a a everywhere across the board. If we don't, we'll end up in a position where our numbers continue to decrease. And this time, more than ever before, given the, the challenges that we face being attacked the way we are as an industry, we have to make sure that we stay the course for diversity and we continue to fight uh, for all of those advocacy issues. And it's, and it's not just happening at the network level. I've had the same kind of conversations and local markets with different things going on, and that's the sort of thing that uh, we've had to do, and that's the sort of thing that we must continue to do. How do we appeal to managers at networks to, I guess, follow this focus of diversity, uh, follow in the footsteps of other of uh, the predecessors who looked at uh, more integrated newsrooms and representing communities of color in their newsrooms? How do you appeal to upper management to do that? Facts. You have to come armed with the facts. You have to be able to point out to them uh, the, the low numbers that they have and show them the impact of having a diverse newsroom. If you don't have a diverse newsroom, that, then you miss out on stories. You know? And it's not, it, it affects the bottom line. And that's what we have to remind them of. You miss out on an entire segment if you don't have someone who represents the African American community, who represents the Hispanic community, who represents the Asian, who represents gays. Then there's like this whole segment of people that you end up ignoring, and people who could be watching you, who could be listening to you, who could be reading your newspapers. And sometimes I think that managers get in the room, and because they, you know, will sometimes just kind of see the world through their eyes. They forget, and they have to be reminded, you know, and there would be perhaps one or two uh, managers of color at the top, but I think we just have to constantly show them the facts in the figures that this is, this is about their bottom line, which is money. You know, this is going to bring you more readers, this is going to bring you more viewers, therefore, you should do what you have to do in order to keep your diversity numbers up, in order to keep your numbers up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, you have to tell them. I mean, you know, uh, some of the things Arthur said is right. This is a reflection, as I see, of your viewership, of your readership. And you should, that should reflect in your newscast. If I'm watching the news, if I'm watching the news, I want to see stories that affect me. I want to see stories that make, you know, sense to my life. And, and I'm no different than anybody else out there, whether it's men, women, blacks, whites, uh, Latinos, you know, the, the gambit, gays, it, it, it doesn't matter. And I think a lot of times, you know, they don't see that because, again, they are looking at the bottom line, but I don't think they're looking at it closely enough. Because if you notice that the majority of people who, one, watch TV, who um, are consumers, are African Americans. I work a lot with Tom Joyner Foundation, Tom Joyner Morning Show. Um, I work on a lot of his events. And he was the first one to prove to, like, Southwest Airlines that African Americans are a large consumer market. And you need to tap into that, and they did, and it's only been good for them. You see how, they, how, how well they're doing. So um, from that example, I mean, that would be a great example of them, but we have to let them know. We have, but one thing you have to do is you have to be in front of them, whether it's going to be in person, via 
technical <laughs> means like we're using today, or some other way, just a phone call. We have to do it, and I think that's what needs to be done more of, so that these news directors, these news managers, um, know what a viable uh, uh, a, a commodity African Americans are, and by having us and our stories out there, it's only going to be good. One, it's the right thing to do. Let's just put it out there. It's the right thing to do. It's the responsible thing to do if you're going to be a news provider to, a, to an audience. So uh, by doing so, that's the, it's the right thing to do. It's also a profitable thing to do if you want to be uh, hardcore and down, you know, and bottom line about it. And uh, they never uh, seem to quarrel about that. There never seems to be a problem with it, doing anything that is uh, uh, profitable or revenue. Uh, and, and to that point, mm -hmm. uh, you know, NABJ has always been strong with advocacy, and we have spent this year. You know, I personally met with news managers at NBC, at CBS, at CNN. Um, I've had conversations with NBC Boston, with Tribune Media, with small stations, uh, KMOU TV in Missouri. You know, and in each conversation, you're not just talking to them about what's going on in their newsroom, you're also talking to them about the importance of, of African American managers to making sure we have more people in management and stuff. So those are ongoing conversations that we're already having. And again, as I said, you know, we are constantly, we encourage our members to let us know what's going on. You know, the whole Sinclair thing that's just not happening. Yes. You know, that is something now that I'm beginning to really research and get into and figure out how are we going to deal with that. I mean, Let's talk about that a little know. bit. Let's, uh, for some people who aren't familiar, this is the Sinclair Broadcasting Company, the possible buyout of Tribune, and of course some of the messaging that they have in their networks um, throughout the country. Tell us a little bit about that and, and what, how you assess that situation. We'll, I'll continue with Dorothy just because she, yeah, and then Gail. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, it's, all, it's a little frightening, quite honestly, that a, a newsroom is being dictated to run editorials, but, you know, it's their candy store. That's what they want in their candy store, but I can tell them that our, our, our members are nervous about this. Uh, we have members in Chicago who work for the Tribune who are worried about Sinclair taking over. And, you know, I, I think, to be fair, this is an opportunity to have a conversation. You know, it, it's kind of unfair to sit back and look at what we're seeing in the news. Uh, for me, the way that I operate is, you know, to attempt to reach out to the people at Sinclair and say, this is what we're told, this is what we're hearing, we need to sit down and talk. You know, because perhaps... Uh, I, I won't say perhaps they don't understand, but you know, perhaps they just need someone to have that conversation and bring the concerns of not just our members, but concerns of people who, are, of all races who work in their newsrooms and are concerned just the influence, the conservative influence that we may very well begin to see at Sinclair that disturbs a lot of journalists. So, um, but of course, you know, our biggest concern is what will happen to our members and the impact it will have on our members. So I really want to have a conversation with Sinclair, but I really want to also hear from those people who work at Sinclair uh, just what's going on. I've had some conversations, I'm beginning to have those conversations, because my thing is about to arm myself with the information first. Mm -hmm. And they're now on the list. You know, like as I said, we, we, you know, NBC, CBS, all of those, Sinclair, now on the list to sit down and begin to say, there are some issues here that we need to address. Good Gail? Well, you can talk to me because I worked for Sinclair for eight years, so I'm very familiar with how they do things. And as a matter of fact, there's still a Sinclair station in my market. As, as a matter of fact, it's under, it's uh, in the same building with one of the stations I work with. I work with the radio station and the television station. And uh, it's, uh, I, I say, interesting. And a lot of the concerns that maybe some of the uh, employees you were talking about, the Tribune employees, they're warranted. I think that, uh, you know, what you can do is, of course, we can always, we always have to talk to uh, the folks who are in charge. In this case, it would be the Smith brothers, um, and uh, find out what we can do. But uh, again, I have the experience with them to talk to them, to know what I'm dealing with, to know uh, what type of management style uh, um, I'm dealing with when it comes to that, uh, and you know how to kind of maybe appeal to them because it's not you know it's not the average bear as, as they say you know it's it's a, they're 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 uh, they've got uh, their own mindset about how they want to do things. They came in saying they were going to do at X amount of stations, and you know this was several years ago, and they are not stopping. They are full steam ahead, and a lot of times what happens in the meantime is they 
they take away newsrooms. Uh, the newsroom that I work for was done away with. Uh, they took away uh, uh, affiliations. We lost our Fox affiliation. So there's a lot of things that have happened. So definitely these conversations need to be had just out of you know, general principle. You do need to go and co uh, contact them, but you need to know, come armed with the right type of information uh, going in. And like I said, having dealt with them for eight years, and sometimes, like I said, we're still dealing with them to a small degree because they're in the same building and uh, uh, conversations with them and some of their management. Uh, I, I definitely know that when I go and I know what I'll know what I'm dealing with. Okay, in that in that regard, you talked a little bit about your background, mm -hmm. and I wanted to let you both more fully explain your background and, and how it prepares you for the position of uh, VP of Broadcast. So, Dorothy, you want to? Oh, you want to go first? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Um, wow. I will celebrate 40 years as a broadcast journalist this year in September. I've worked at five stations. Uh, Peoria, Denver, Memphis, Pittsburgh, and I've spent the last 32 years in Chicago at the CBS station. Uh, that is a lot of experience, and that is a lot of credibility in this industry. Uh, I'm also a working mom. I have three children. They are now millennials, which means that I empathize with millennials. I understand them. Uh, I want to help them. I understand their dreams, and I can connect with millennials as well because I have them. <laughs> um, I have been a victim of racism, sexism, classism. I have experienced job loss, so I also understand what it takes to survive in this business. I understand those people who um, have issues trying to get to this organization, trying to find the money to to survive. Uh, you know, I got fired from my first job, and I only made eighty-seven hundred dollars a year. So I understand uh, the difficulties of that, but at the same time, I have been very fortunate. Uh, I've won numerous Emmys, nine or ten of them, I kind of lost count, and I've had the opportunities and been very fortunate to work in some other award-winning stories so that I understand and I know what it means to work hard, uh, and because I have been in this industry so long, and because I understand television so well, and I've had to, I've worked in so many places, and I've had a lot of different hats over the last four years, uh, from reporter to uh, weekend anchor, talk show host, radio host. Uh, I've, I've done it all so that uh, I can also relate to many of our broadcasters. I was a newspaper contributor as well, so I understand and relate to uh, a, a lot of our different members so that I think that prepares me to sit down with news managers and speak their language. I can push back, so there are times, and I've had these conversations where managers will say, well, this happened because of this reason, and we uh, didn't mean to do this because of that, and I can push back and say, well, you then have issues because this got past the director, it got past the producer, it got past the anchor, it got past this person, which gives me, which tells me that there are larger problems because I've had to deal with that for a very long time. I believe in chapters. I have been a leader in every city that I have worked in. I have been a leader of the chapters. I've been on the board of our local chapter in Chicago uh, ever since, ever since um, I've been there the last 32 years. This is my second stint on the NABJ board. I spent six years on the NABJ board in the late 80s, early 90s. I was Region 5 director. Uh, as Region 5 director at that time, it was Chicago, Milwaukee, and Detroit. Uh, I oversaw two very successful national conventions at that time, uh, 1997 in Chicago, and again, 2008, Unity in Chicago. So I know how to raise money. Uh, I know how to, um, I know what this organization means. This organization is very special to me. Um, I 
give you some more background <laughs> as we go along. <laughs> I, well, yeah. I have uh, 35 years of experience, 30 with NABJ in both TV and radio, and also some PR as well. Um, I've been on the board for the past four years as the Region 3 Director over 11 states, uh, which is a lot of states, 40-some chapters, and we've got three more probably coming in. <laughs> so it is a lot. So I, I definitely have the experience of being in this industry. I've worked as a uh, news anchor, a news reporter, a talk show host and producer, um, Chief Cook and Bonner Washer, sometimes I want to say, because sometimes you're doing everything. Um, I, you know, so I've done all that. I've worked with a number of people in various markets, from New York to Virginia to uh, North Carolina, where I am now, in Raleigh, at several uh, stations in the, the various markets. I also do work with the uh, Tom Joyner Foundation. I think I told you Tom Joyner Morning Show, which I, uh, with Tom was a news anchor in Raleigh, but uh, now I'm a field producer for the cruise, uh, the Tom Joyner cruise, which raises millions of dollars for students uh, at uh, HBCUs, and also his uh, uh, family reunion, which uh, is at, over the Labor Day holiday, and uh, which I do the same thing, I'm a field producer and uh, media liaison for them, and I come back year after year, I think I've done now my 10th cruise, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, and it's very rewarding. Uh, that's part of what I do as far as being a, a chapter leader, I've been president, for a couple of terms, as well as vice president, fundraising chair, and marketing for um, uh, my, tri my chapter, Triangle Association by Journalists, also was uh, in Virginia Beach, uh, the, what used to be called the, it was now it's the Hampton Roads Black Media Professionals, that, but back in the day, it was called the Triangle Media Professionals, TNP. But, uh, so I've been involved in every, pretty much every market, just like George. I think we have some, some similar, similar backgrounds as far as that's concerned. But um, I've done, gone through the same thing. You can't be in this business uh, for as long as we've been in it and not have dealt with discrimination on, on gender, pay, uh, you know, uh, work assignments. It's, it, and as a matter of fact, to be personal, just recently, I, the radio station I was working at just uh, decided they'd rather have a white man doing what I was doing and reduce my hours. Uh, and so I sat there and they said, well, it's not a good fit. And I'm like, oh, gee, is that code for something? And it made me think. And it was this, it was two days after we all announced our candidacy. And I thought, oh, is this you know the money issue? I mean, I've got to pay my mortgage. Is this going to be a, a problem for me to do this? So I prayed on it. And I thought, what would Jesus do? And I said, you know, maybe it's a hint. Then I thought, how could I not? Because I am what many people. I'm going through what many people are going through in NABJ. You know, you're sitting up there being told you're not a good fit, or yeah, we'd rather have somebody's daughter. That's happening too at the same news station. You know, uh, do this, but they're not telling you that. They're not telling you in the means. So I know what it feels like right now to have my, you know, to have pay cuts and to have assignment cuts, and to actually not even have my name put on an award that I executive produced, had to go back and tell them, oh no, this is not going to happen. How's my name not on it when I did everything? So I understand what that's like. And I thought, I, have, I am an ABJ right now. I am what a lot of our members are going through. I have to at least step up and try to represent them the best way I can with the experience that I have um, because I know what it's like. There is, diversity is a, a word, it used to be more of a buzzword, not so much anymore. Because if, it, it seems that if, they, if you don't have to have folks in those positions of color or, or, or gender, eh, you know, we're okay. Nobody's saying anything. A lot of things have been cut back. So we still have to step up to that. So I apologize if I'm getting off on a, on a tangent, but it is obviously something that, you know, I want to let, let you know that I do have that experience. I have seen that, and I will fight for our members. You know, I definitely believe in them. I have many of them. Of course, I talk to on a chapter level all the time. I have a very close relationship with my chapters, and I listen to them. They come to me sometimes just with their issues about their jobs. I've helped folks get jobs. You know, and so maybe I need to get one for myself. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, definitely something that's utmost in my mind. I believe that the members and the chapters are what make NABJ what it is, a membership organization, and that's where we need to start. Um, and again, for my, for my one last thing, I apologize. I also have six successful regionals, regional conferences under my belt, which all made uh, tens of thousands of dollars for the organization and brought lots of professional development to our members, and we're planning another one next year, but I don't know if I should do a, a shameless plug. <laughs> but yeah, we're in the process of planning one now. I'm still planning for the next year because the work continues. The work continues. Okay, well, I'll follow up on that. <laughs> um, you, you both are veterans, obviously, of the industry, and you've, you've made it through 
many years of change and it's still changing and I wanted to know there's the diversity issue has been ongoing it's never gone away and in addition now we have to face and, and deal with uh, ageism as I would call it where the targeted hiring is that you know for what I would call entry level 20 something yeah. and there doesn't seem to be much focus on from the uh, industry perspective on retaining people. And in ABJ at the same time, and WABJ, we're all fighting to you know, keep diversity in the industry. At the same time, we have these other forces working against us. How, what, how do we push back against that? Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> I'm probably a good example of that. Um, I'm a survivor. Yes. Uh, I have managed to stay at the same station for 32 years. Um, and a lot of that is because I have answered every time that has come up. I have figured out how to grow, how to change, how to make sure that I remain valuable to this company. I just signed another contract. <laughs> Um, from the time when I started at the station, I was a general assignment reporter. When I saw the trend going towards consumer reporting, I said, I want to learn that aspect of it. And then I lobbied to become a consumer reporter. I became a consumer reporter. When I saw it going down again, I always kept my foot in the GA, general assignment, foot the um, track. And then I began to see that having more than one hat was valuable. So I reached out and I said, in addition to doing television, I should do radio. And then I became a talk show host in addition to that. I saw that they wanted you to have uh, that print side. And then I took that consumer show and said, we should have a relationship with a newspaper and then I wrote for newspapers. And now I am at that point that I wear three or four different hats. Uh, and now I also do some investigative journalism at the same time. My point, if we are going to survive, we have to continue to grow, we have to continue to learn, and I think that's what this organization is doing. I think it is important for our members today, and of course, like all of you, I tweet, I Facebook, I Snapchat, I, I do it all. And I think what our veteran members in particular need to do in order to make sure that you will maintain, you will continue um, to be retained in your job, is to learn those skills. The biggest complaint that I hear uh, in our newsroom is that those of us who are veterans sometimes, we don't want to learn whatever the new skill is in terms of editing, uh, in, t in terms of writing content uh, for, for the web, uh, in terms of shooting. And I think you know, those are workshops that we do have some of, but I think those are workshops that we need to have more of because what we have the advantage we bring to the table is our years of experience, our journalistic know-how, and imagine if we combine that with the editing that they're looking for, the shooting that they're looking for, the producing that they're looking for. We will then be able, I think, to outlast and outshine that person who's competing against us. And that, you know, I think that every time my bosses get ready to say, uh, you know, do I want to get rid of her, then they have to look at the fact that I have the knowledge, I know the city, and on top of that, I know a little editing. I know how to shoot if I have to, and I'm willing to do all those things and still continue to bring what they need to the table. So the bottom line is that we have to continue to grow and we have to accept the fact that we have to learn other skills, and I think uh, we're going to see many more workshops mm -hmm. at NABJ looking at that and bringing that to our veteran journalists in particular. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if you were on the other webinar that we did, you heard me talk about something very similar to what you're talking about, Donna, where we want to do, some, one thing I had an idea was calling it a mid-level mentorship program because of some of the things that Dorothy said. We need to be able to be updated on some of the new technology. Um, we have the skills, we have the basics, which sometimes a lot of the younger folks are still working on. But we've got all those, but sometimes we don't have those, those skills that are up and coming. Those, you know, especially when it comes to technology. So that's something that I want to do where we take some of these folks that we have in our organization and we basically provide a mentorship program for those of us who are, you know, in the mid level of our career. I don't want to say old, but the mid level of our career where we're trying to decide, well, listen, I want to stay in this business. I don't want to go to something else. I want to stay in this business. I, but, but what do I need to know? What do I need to do? And, uh, and we either assigned mentors or we just assigned programming, professional development, that, and training, hands-on training that teaches them what they need to do. So this is actually a full program that I've already thought out and want to do because I'll probably be one of the recipients of a lot of people trying to work on it myself. I think it's very necessary. Um, uh, you know, I, I too have had to you know, switch around. I was doing traffic. I was learning that. I learned how to edit a long time ago. Learned how to produce, and I'm producing. I'm doing talk shows, I do radio, I do TV, I do uh, you know, some field producing, as I think I was telling you. Because you do have to survive. But uh, some of this stuff, they're not going to teach you, and I think we need to help each other. And I think this mid-level mentorship program will be a way of doing that, and a way to show our members who have been here and have been in the trenches with us for a long time that we appreciate them and that we want them to succeed and to be able to stay in this, in this business that we love so much. I guess I kind of have a question. Sure. Um, <laughs> hi, Nikki Mayo, Baltimore Association of Black Journalists, President, um, Regional One Deputy Director, person. Okay, um, with all this looming gloom and doom when it comes to our industry, we realize that uh, students are still being pumped out of J schools. By you know, right. they're just coming out no matter what. They keep going. Whether it be um, you know, <laughs> and they keep growing into it, but. You know, how do you continue to keep them energized, excited about what what's out there, considering, frankly, what's out there when it comes to uh, job stability, when it comes to pay, which never was pretty ever. We get that idea. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to what you're going to be expected to do, uh, the backpack, the multimedia journalist, whatever phrase you want to throw on it, the reality is that they need to be uh, jack of all trades, master of what. So what exactly do you suggest when it comes to we're going to have student projects every year. How do you keep them excited about this, energized about this, I guess particularly for us on the uh, broadcast side? You know, I think student projects is, is great. I wish, you know, when I was younger that, you know, I could have taken part in something like that. The problem with student projects, and we have um, a short course, which the two short courses, which is great as well, there's only so many slots for, you know, for so many people. Mm -hmm. And so I think definitely, one, when we do talk to these news directors and these news managers, and we talk to these students, make sure they're getting these internships. Because if you're in this and you really love it, you'll know when you're, when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. I mean, the thing that I always joke how I say we've got this broadcast and we've got this media disease because we love it so much, we'll do it. We'll do it for low pay. We'll do it when we have to stand out in the rain holding onto a bush telling everybody it's a hurricane coming. You know, we'll do that because we love what we do. We love um, informing people about what's going on and what's, what's important in their lives. So we have to instill in them that love, or at least show them, put them in the position where they can experience it. And if they love it the way they should, they'll be energized to continue on through the craziness, through the attack on the media that we're, you know, that we're dealing with now, through whatever administration is in the White House and whatever they try to dictate. Uh, I, I just feel like we need to um, share our love of NABJ with them. And one way we can do that is by making more opportunities for them, whether it's through uh, more, more people in the short course or more short courses, if that's even possible. I know that's, that's a money thing. Or just um, making sure that they get involved in those internships. And when they have those internships, and this is one thing I did when I was in charge of internships at my station, make sure that they're not filing. You know, 10% of what you do needs to be administrative. Everything else needs to be hands-on. If you're, well, if you're in an internship to be a reporter, you need to be out with the reporter. You need to be right. I might in terms of write stories for me. And it's okay, let me take it. If it's something good, I'll, and I'll, I'll use it. You know, not, not, not a full story. I mean, you know, a couple of lines. I might do my whole work, all my work for me. But I did have them do that. So you really have to immerse them in this business in order to, to as you asked, to energize them and to keep them going. Okay, is your question... How do we inspire them? 
That's inspire them realistically, though, because I think they already are inspired by lights, camera, action. Yeah. They're inspired okay. by my voice on the radio. Yeah, we'll but be they're, realistic. You know, we want to be realistic with them too about what's happening. I thought you just scaring scared. them off. Yeah. You know, here's what I tell the the, um, the students that I speak to, whether it's on a high school level or a college level. Um, you have to love this, you know, and I and I think that those high school the college students who want to be journalists, um, I don't think that they get deterred. Because all those who get deterred don't need to do this. Mm -hmm. Because you have to want this. You have to be willing to make the sacrifices. I belong to a group called Black Women in TV, Black Women on TV, a Facebook group. It is absolutely fabulous. And, and one of the things that I try to bring to that group is the reality that what you are going through now, you know, you're saying that I don't make a lot of money, um, and I, I barely I have to take another job, and I remind them that this is the way it has always been. I mean, when I started in Peoria, I, I didn't, with $8,700 a year, I couldn't pay the rent and the car note in the same month, so I just switched back and forth. Nothing has really changed. Uh, so what you say to them is that there, if you stick with it, if you continue to learn your craft and do your craft well, at some point you will continue to progress and you will grow. But here's the reality. Unlike when I started, you could get to a major market like Chicago, you could get to Pittsburgh, you could get to Kansas City, and you were probably financially going to be doing pretty well. In today's reality, you better love it perhaps more than I did, because in the beginning, your time of being struggling may be a little longer, because there, there's too much competition today. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when we started, there were a handful of television stations, a handful of radio stations. Now, you're talking hundreds of them? And all those jobs and people wanting them, you have to look at the fact that this is going to be something that may take you a little longer um, because of the competition. But then, Nikki, they have to do things like you do. Because of the competition, you have to seek out every internship there is. You have to um, do the side hustles. You have to, when you're in college, even if you don't have that internship during the summertime, you didn't get that DC Post, Washington Post internship, then you go to your neighborhood paper and you volunteer. You find the digital outlet and you volunteer. You make sure that every summer your resume is packed. And you make sure that when you are in school on the weekends, what it says what you did on the weekends was you volunteered at the radio station. You know, you did what you had to do on campus so that when you get ready to get out and get a job, your resume is long because the competition is tougher. It is more. And you have to be a jack of all trades. But if you really are passionate about it, if you really want to tell the stories, if you really want to be a part of this industry, if you really want to be the Nickies and the West and the Joe Davises and, the, and the, all those who you see at the NEBJ, then I would just implore you to just stick with it. Understand that it's going to be a struggle a little bit longer. Stick with it. But look at those. And some of them, you know, the millennials that are out there, that they've, they've made it, they're doing well. It is possible. Just hang in there. I don't know if I answered all of your question about the struggle part of it, but I thought you asked I was trying about to think the something that probably was not already asked. So I think you, I think you covered it. You're fine. <laughs> um, is, I didn't the internship want to is very important. That's why I always yeah. tell my students, do more than one. Because that'll tell you more, sometimes more about what you don't want than what you do want. Yeah. <laughs> And then, you know, I, the, the other thing is um, look at all kinds of industries. You know, I mean, look, look at every, every different lane. Um, you know, 
you don't have to just be, there's, there's so much out there today. I tell you, if I, if, if I could do it all over again, it would be great to be a millennial today and have all the choices of digital and, you know, being able to wear all of these hats. But I won't, I'll, you know. Well, I think they're looking question. at that more than, obviously, we didn't have to look at it, but I think they are looking, the young people are looking at that. You know? That's pretty but probably much, that's first pretty before pretty they're looking at, yeah. before they're looking at TV or radio. Yeah, <laughs> but they do see themselves reflected more in that. That's and why, it's, and it's like it's coming down to you're seeing more of a veneer or a window dressing on some stations yeah. because they have to have people of color on there. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they have to have a voice. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing more and more of that. Which is sure. why I am pushing the producer database for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I have to admit, I went to school to be a producer, and somewhere along the way. You know, early on, some news director said, get in front of the camera, so I did. But I wanted to be a producer because, to your point, that is where the power is. That's where the decisions are made. And what I'm hoping is that the producer database that, that I've created, uh, our members will be able to upload their reels and their resumes. Um, and it will be a directory. And when we talk about producers, I'm not just talking about television producers, I'm talking about radio producers, online producers, social media producers, uh, content producers, podcast producers. If you work for a newspaper and you do editing and stuff for the website, then all of those producers should be on the directory because that is a directory that we will be sharing, selling, figuring out how to connect to news managers who will be looking at those producers because that's how we're going to answer the question of diversity. Mm -hmm. Because if we can get more producers into the pipeline and we know that's the management track, they become producers, mm -hmm. they become associate producers, they become VPs, they become senior VPs, and now we end up having more African American producers in the room that are making the major decisions. And now we see an impact on the news that we do, on who gives the news, and who makes the decisions. And you know, so that is a way of really attempting to make a difference. And I try to encourage kids to not just look at uh, the television side, but you know, look behind the scenes. You can get a job in a heartbeat. You want a job? Be a producer. Mm -hmm. You will get a job. Who would have access to this database? Only members. Mm -hmm. Only members. And so I encourage you to join the National because it is going to be a benefit for members. If you are not a member and you've already uploaded your reel, that's okay. We're going to send you an email and an application that asks you.